Hello, everybody. We're here today with a true legend, a true creator, uh, with Drews Butad. Hope I didn't butcher it too much, uh, Drews. Oh, no, uh, Drews, <laughs> Drews is a is a what what we call a real uh, creator. He not only created a whole technology, but created a movement, an open source uh, movement around a technology. So we're here today to discuss one topic that's very uh, near and dear to my heart, which is digital product management. Uh, we see a lot of our clients, a lot of a lot of people trying to do it those days. There's a couple books and you know a couple of bibliography talking about how to do it, uh, but it's uh, it's always uh, easier in, in theory, right, Riz? So uh, yes. we're really to, we're here we're here to actually to to in the on the purpose of this uh, web series here is actually you know here in front of the trenches and people that actually uh, have real uh, business world problems to solve around that discipline and trying to uh, dig deeper uh, on that. But before we, we go, uh, Dries, why don't you kind of just give us a little bit of a, what, what's your role today at Acquia and at the, you know, the, the Drupal community so we can kind yeah. of understand what, what their challenge is. Yeah, sounds good. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so my role or roles, because <laughs> there's really two parts to my story, uh, Bruno. One is I started the Drupal project like 21, 22 years ago, a long time ago. And I'm still the project lead today. So I've been doing that for a long time. And for people that don't know, op Drupal is an, an open source project. It's open source software that people and organizations use to build websites and powers a lot of websites in the world, including a lot of large websites. Um, and I actually did that as a hobby project for the first seven years. Uh, it's what I would work on at night, on the weekends, you know, that kind of stuff. And then after seven years, I co-founded Acquia. And Acquia was born out of Drupal. Um, today we're in a digital experience platform company. So we're a technology company um, and we provide different solutions for organizations that want to, you know, be digital winners, if you will. And uh, that includes a lot of different things, but at Acquia, I'm the chief technology officer. And in my case, that means uh, I also run product management and product marketing uh, and a few other things. Um, so that's briefly what I do, and I split my time between these two things. Really cool, Driss. So, so uh, a lot of our clients and, and, and people that we talk in the industry that are trying to kind of uh, deploy the disciplines of uh, product management, right? They, they, it's, it's first of all, it's a very complex discipline because it involves usually like a, a tripod there, right? So people that run that discipline, they, they must understand the technology. They must understand the 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 user experience, the customer experience that that's mm -hmm. consume, consuming that experience, right? And also the business side of it, you know, how we actually make money, how the company actually get the return on that investment, right? So, in those three disciplines, it's uh, it's very hard to get into just one uh, under just one head, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 first first thing people struggle is like to find product managers right so who are those people you know the, those unicorns like right? kind of a, <laughs> that are, that know that all right because when you try to recruit from the industry usually people are you know they're good in one or, or on most two of those disciplines because where are they coming from you know the functions that they uh, they operate under right so so where do you at Acquia uh, or at the Drupal project where do you find the you know the most promising uh, I know. Do you develop your own product managers? Do you hire them for the market? If you hire, like, where do they come from? Those uh, those uh, rare. Yeah, people? yeah. They're probably the most difficult people to hire, as you pointed out, because, as you said, they have to be good at many different things, right? Um, they have to understand the product. They have to be business savvy. Um, they have to be customer savvy. All of these things. So they're hard to find because very often. The very, very good ones, they actually end up becoming CEOs <laughs> because in a way, a product manager is sort of a mini CEO. You know, they're the CEO yeah. of their product. Um, and so, you know, often those people that are extremely good at product management, they often choose to become a CEO. Um, but anyhow, to answer your question, um, one thing that has helped us, I would say, is um, depending on the product, 
um, we find kind of different ways to source them sometimes. Uh, what I mean by that is if we have a large and mature product, uh, and then it's almost like domain expertise becomes a little bit less important. And it's more about sort of the operational discipline of running a product. So we can kind of recruit um, from a larger pool. Sometimes we find really good managers and they come from different departments and different uh, disciplines, but they just have a good talent in being a manager. But like on the flip side, if it, if it, if it's about a new product, we're building something new and we want to bring that to market and it's really all about market understanding and customer understanding. Uh, we've actually had great success um, recruiting uh, product managers from our own professional services organization. Like Acquia isn't a professional services company, like we're a product company, but we have a small um you know, professional services team. It's I think it's less than 10% of our revenue actually right now. But that said, the people that work in our professional services organization, they have often worked with customers for, you know, five, six, seven years. And they've seen the customer problems. They feel the customer pain. They know what the customer wants to do. And we found that those can actually very easily be recruited as a product manager. And then with the right coaching and training, uh, you know, they, they become really good product managers often. Um, so, you know, different strategies depending on the maturity of the product and the needs. Um, but we try to recruit from within and we've had great success with that. And obviously there's also classically trained product managers that have been a product manager at many different organizations that we, we have a lot of those uh, people too, of course. Uh, but it's hard sometimes to learn a market and to really understand the customer needs. It can take years to become a true expert. Yeah, it is so complicated of a problem that it's some of our clients uh, that have decided to create kind of a uh, teams of uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 like replace one person with two, sometimes three people. Mm -hmm. So I have like a triad uh, running a product, like a really kind of sharing the leadership of a product, of course, has to be a certain scale, right? So we cannot mm -hmm. have like a three people leading five, right? <laughs> Those are yeah. usually like big, big products, mm -hmm. but uh, but they have this. This was a, a solution that some of our clients found. Like it's just yeah. so hard to find someone that has all the the the, the depth of knowledge necessary. Like uh, they yeah. they have like groups, uh, teams of uh, of exacts. Yeah, uh, running, yeah, running that's a strategy product. that can definitely work. You know, make little teams. Um, yeah. I, you know, a, a lot of the best product managers are stakeholder managers too. Like even when they don't know everything themselves, which obviously most of them don't, um, they're really good at working with customers and sales and marketing and finance. Like they're really, really good at managing all the different stakeholders to kind of get the job done. And, and yeah. they're good at learning. They're good at um, processing information. Good at knowing what they're not good at and, and find the right people that can. That, that's can help right. Them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. That's what they have to be good at, right? Because it's impossible for one person often to do everything and be good at every single thing. But if you can, if you're good at, let's say, the sort of the, the market side of things, sometimes those people aren't as strong on the financial side of things. And then they, the good ones know how to work with finance, the finance teams and the department on how to, you know, kind of help get the support they need there i love the, the your analogy around the the ceo right like uh, that it's like a mini ceo like because is, a product yeah. is a mini company right that they're they have their own sometimes they have their own their own pnl and they have to have their own results and clients and value proposition and everything that a that, a, right. client, that a company has right so right. which that which that brings me to, to the to the my second question mm -hmm. which is the 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 one of the biggest struggles that we see is the definition what the product actually enco mm -hmm. encompasses. Like, well, what is the perimeter? What's the scope of a product, right? So there's a, even traditional companies are trying to kind of a move from project to more product oriented. So looking at the those platforms, ecosystems, and, the, and those kind of mm -hmm. a, some of their digital experiences, trying to put, you know, uh, under uh, a product lenses, right? You know, and then one question that uh, that comes up a lot is actually, what, what's the if we're talking about a cross-functional, a, a mini company-like initiative, right? What, what's the perimeter, right? Well, where 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 the the product teams start and where they end, right? So what what's shared 
in what's dedicated to that product. Right? So yeah. I'd love to hear your in your experience, you know, how you guys been making that decision, like uh, when you kind of make a team shared across the product, across different products, when you kind of dedicated people to to a certain team. I'd love to kind of uh, what what's the, the drivers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, behind those decisions. Yeah, it's a couple of questions in there, I think. But yes. That could um, be a book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a question around scope first, right? And then yeah. another question about teams, I think. So if, I think for scope, um, when we launch a new product or sometimes a large feature of an existing product, uh, we always really like to start with identifying the problems that customers face. I think it's really important to start with the customer problem and also to make sure that enough customers have that particular problem, meaning there's actually a market problem. You know, There's an opportunity in the market to solve that problem. So we just try to define an MVP, uh, first of all. And there's a couple of things that we really try to look for. One is um, when we built the, the product, the MVP product, uh, we need to win in the market, you know? And so we, we call it, we need a plan to win. Um, we, you can go build something and if it doesn't allow you to win, but there's no point building it. So it, we need to allow us to win. And secondly, we also want to get to market quickly. So we really strongly believe in delivering incremental value. Like we need to be able to launch something in six to nine months that provides value to those customers that have a particular problem. If it takes two or three years to build something and bring it to market, like we, we won't even start the product, you know, it's just too slow to, and like we can start learning quick enough. So we're big believers of launching something quickly and then the, you're just problem, learning and iterating. In three, in three years, the problem that they're trying to solve is probably it's different. It's probably problem, right? gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's what we try to do. And so we start with making a plan on what we want to do, a vision. Usually there's a vision, there's a strategy, and then there's a plan. The way the product manager goes about that is, as I mentioned, you know, he or she is the main person to build the vision, the strategy, and the plan. But very often there's always, there's almost always an engineering leader involved as well. And very often uh, a user experience person as well. So these three people are sort of the uh, the, the three legs of the stool that are creating kind of the plan and, and very often architecture too. When I say engineering, that includes architecture because we try to lead with user experience and we also try to lead with architecture when creating these plans. Um, and then as I mentioned, product management is stakeholder management, right? So uh, before we actually start writing a single line of code, we've run these plans by every different department sales, marketing, support, finance, and every department has a critical role to play. You know, sales need to say, yep, we can sell this. If you build this, we can sell this. You know, marketing needs to figure out if you build it, how are we going to market it? How much does it cost for us to market? So they need to, they're part of the plan, frankly, like they have to kind of figure out the right budgets. And support is another part of the plan because they have to obviously support the product and the feature. And they usually have a lot of questions around, you know, how can we automate the right thing so we don't have to do everything manual? Have you thought about provisioning? Have you thought about this? Uh, all of those things. And then obviously finance is a key stakeholder too because whenever you build a product, you need to make sure you can deliver it, uh, you know, at the right cost, you know, like... It has to be usually profitable uh, and the cost has to be uh, in line and you know finance usually wants to understand the impact on on the growth of the company the gross margins of the company these kinds of things so again everybody's involved really you know in figuring out the plan before we write a single line of code um it, it, yeah. um, to my to my second question let, let's say then then you start let's say you get approval on the plan you know mm -hmm. start doing it so do, do you happen to have a, a, you know, a rule of thumb, like a, who should be dedicated to their product? You mentioned, for example, like the engineering and customer experience. So are they usually kind of put them uh, dedicated, like a, a team, you kind of a yeah. slice a piece of that engineering team and dedicate to that product, or they continue to kind of reporting, you know, to the head of engineering and they're just like a, their project, yeah. they're, they're projectized in, in that product. Yeah. Right? So 
How how do, how do you do the mix. engagement? Yeah. Yeah, usually engineering is dedicated to the product, for example. And actually part of the plan is figuring out how large of an engineering team do you need, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Or it gets a little bit more tricky um, or nuanced, at least in our case. Uh, and by the way, Acquia, we have like 10 or more different products. So that's also important to 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 know, like we're, we're a multi-product company. So for example, when it comes to user experience, um, we have... Uh, user experience people that are dedicated to a product, but we also have some shared user experience people. And that's important too, because there's pros and cons to both, right? Like if you're dedicated to a product, the user experience person or, or people, they can really become an expert in the product. They can do research, all the kinds of things. So they start to really know their customers. They also start to know competitors, for example, in the market and that expertise, that knowledge is very valuable when trying to build a product. Now, we also have shared UX people, as I mentioned, and the reason for that is because we also want to um, provide sort of a, a consistent experience across our different products, right? And so we want to make sure we think about things like single sign-on or consistent... Um, Design system that's kind of a exactly. consistent process. That's right. And so those functions in our world at Acquia, they're kind of centralized. And we have that for most disciplines. So we have centralized or shared resources, as well as dedicated resources for most disciplines that includes user experience, as I mentioned, but it also includes architecture. So our chief architect sits across all of the different products and make sure there's a certain amount of consistency around architecture and choice of technology components so we're not building things in you know seven different competing technologies when we don't have to um the same thing with uh like qe or qa you know quality assurance quality engineering like because across all of the different products we want to have one definition of what we call a sev zero or a sev one these could be you know outages right so like you want to have some consistency across all of the different products. So that is driven by shared resources, but then uh, every product also has its dedicated uh, resources. And that's probably only important when you're, when you're a multi-product company like we are. But in a single product company, fortunately, things are a little bit more uh, easier that way. You know, I was asking from the from the lenses of most of our clients are kind of a traditional companies trying to digitize themselves like, and getting more into the you know the what the 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 the, the best practices of digital natives uh, as mm -hmm. as yourselves at Aqua, for example, do right. So, and what the, their reality is usually they're coming from a very function based structure, right? So where mm -hmm. they have all the they have engineering, they have architecture, they have all the teams. But they organize themselves. What crosses all those functions usually is a project, right? right. Which kind of a, is born and, and and it's completed and goes away, right? So, right. so that that's when when kind of a trying to shift from that paradigm, from a product paradigm, from mm -hmm. a more where products are more uh, alive, right? So products you put right. in front of customers, you never just do a project and let them go into maintenance mode because then, right. then you're screwed. <laughs> you actually <laughs> have to always keep improving them all the time, right? So it, which brings us to the to the operational model of a product, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, but, and we, one of the be biggest benefits that we see trying to convince them to move to this um, operational model is, is actually to get the engagement of the people, right? So when people feel more connected to something that is touching clients and customers mm -hmm. and seeing the result of their, their decisions and their work in a more immediate form, as you put it, like, you know, just short runs, right? Short yeah. deliveries, not, nothing like a, one of the problems. Like when you work in those function modes, it can take years to, to, to see the result of your work, right? right. When, you, when you kind of uh, move to that different uh, organization design, you, you see it, you know, and, and, and usually improves engagement, right? People feel that their 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 voices are heard, their contributions are you know taken into mm -hmm. consideration and they if you're more engaged then you know then and they will contribute to the success of that product, which is absolutely key. Right. So mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, if you if you can draw and I, I, I was really curious to see what the the if you can draw parallels when your work at Acquia, which 
certainly, you know, by organizing it the way it is, I'm pretty sure, you know, mm-hmm. you have that engagement out of people and, you know, and, and, and you, you have the, you see the motivation of people uh, geared towards that. But what, what, how do you compare to the a completely different type of engagement, which is the open source world, yeah. right? Where, where people just literally work out of uh, their, hundred percent of their intrinsic motivation to do something yeah right? yeah and, uh, and, and it's very uh, different yeah. <laughs> i can tell you that and it took me a while because uh as i mentioned drupal predated aquia so yeah. you know i had a certain way of doing things in drupal and my leadership style in drupal uh which was working well in drupal and then when i started aquia to learn to adjust <laughs> my yeah. leadership yeah. style but also like how you build products you know yes. in a you know for-profit company versus in an open source or non-profit style environment, right? So as you as you pointed out, at Acquia, there is different constraints. So when we built a product, um, obviously, you know, we wanted to make money. <laughs> we have a limited budget and, and that kind of stuff. So we have to work through a lot of these things. In open source, it's not about making money. We don't really care <laughs> about money in a way, you know? And so it's very different yeah. environments. Um, but also the leadership is different too. Like in open source, I really have to lead, let's say like 100% uh, by inspiring and, and, and motivating people to go in a certain direction. Uh, I have to paint a picture of like, here's what we could do and what Drupal could be if we do these things. And then hopefully people feel inspired and excited to contribute to Drupal in that direction, um, which, which is great. And obviously at Acquia, you know, for-profit company, you do the same thing, really. You, you hope to inspire people too, but sometimes <laughs> you can also say, you know, enough discussion, here's what we're gonna do. No more debates, you know, we've listened, we, we've incorporated people's feedback, let's go. In open source, it's harder to kind of say, all right, no more debate. You always have to listen to people, always have to incorporate their feedback and, you know, don't. Don't get me wrong, that's that's wonderful too, but it's just a different you know, way of going about it as well. Um yeah, it was was just super curious because you know we mm-hmm. see as a as a kind of a big, big trend, like uh not only in the corporate world, but mainly in the corporate world, but but uh, overall as a society, we see a big trend of uh tapping into people's intrinsic motivations and mm-hmm. try, you know, corporate world trying to align with uh with personal motivations yeah. and, and, and it's important looking in the less, world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Looking less of, uh, you know, into, in terms of an, an, an extrinsic motivations and more on intrinsic yeah. motivations. I, I wonder if you have kind of a, applied in your for learnings into the open source community at Acquia and what, what yeah. those were like, uh, what are the, the things? I think it's important to have as an organization, it's important to have a purpose and a vision. You know, a lot of people are purpose driven. They want to be part of something, you know, and that betters the world. You know, it sounds a little cheesy, but it's true. <laughs> I'm the same way, right? And so it's important to help people recognize the value that an organization brings to the world and to others in the world. And, you know, in open source, it's in a way more natural. <laughs> in a in a for-profit environment, it's maybe sometimes less natural, but it's often there. I mean, you know, you can talk about Acquia and what we do and how we help improve uh, digital experiences and how we help people share and publish their ideas. And like, there's a lot of, you know, we help thousands of nonprofits. We help thousands of of um, of higher education uh, organizations and they have important missions in the world, right? And so we help important organizations uh, fulfill their mission, which is, you know, improves the world too. So whatever it is, there's usually a why that really will inspire people to become part of your organization. Um, you know, the fact that Acquia, and by the way, CINT as well, like CINT, I mean, as you know, you're one of the largest contributors to Drupal. That is a nice thing that employees love, you know, they love being part of an organization that gives back, gives back to the world. And that could be true. Uh, contribution to open source. I mean, that's that's what a lot of why a lot of people join Acquia because we we understand open source. We want to help advance open source. It's not just about making money all the time. <laughs> it's also about giving back uh, to different organizations that are part of our ecosystem or that we depend on or that we 
um, you know, that that we take advantage of in a way, you know, or that we get the benefit from, I should say, we can also give back to these organizations, which is nice. Yes, it is. It is, it is nice. And quite frankly, I, I think we'll become table stakes quite soon, like a, because, you know, like a, people that are talented and can do what we're talking about here, which is very difficult. Yeah. They can pick, yeah. you know, to work for wh whoever they want, whatever they want, whenever they want, right? So, yeah, especially with remote that, work uh, becoming yes. more yeah. of the norm. You have more, every engineer, let's say, or every employee yeah. has more choices of where he or she could work because everybody's hiring remote people. So, it, it creates a more competitive situation. It requires organizations to be a more compelling um employer you yeah. know which in, is great in respect for yeah exactly in respect for of, of their desires right of mm -hmm. their ambitions to contribute like and how they will what's their purpose and, and align try to align those purposes and and motivation right because it, it's uh, i think will be long gone in a couple of years will be long gone that the years of you know would tell people what they what they have to what do. It? It would be yeah. really hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so either, either people are doing out of you know mm -hmm. that's what motivate them to achieve yeah. those things. You know, like and yeah. they're what what organizations are just creating is just trying to create that alignment you know, that the pro, pro, like really provide the space to them to kind of uh, to do in to do what they love. Right. So that's. Right. Uh, that's what I, I what I I hope it will will happen you know more and more in, in more uh, corporate in, in environments and quite frankly I think it would be amazing right to see you know in environments that are that are today are kind of stale and and we'll, I, I think will come up to be you know vibrant uh, places for people to work and, and really thrive. Let it be true. <laughs> hope, hope, hope we can see more of that more more you know Drupal communities and more you know Aquas out there. Yeah. Well, well Dries, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And I, I, I'm sure there's a lot here for people, you know, that, uh, that are looking for uh, implement those ideas uh, to actually tap into. So th thank you so much for your, uh, yeah. your kindness to join and, and share your wisdom here with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man. See you soon. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.